Nea is the founding engineer of Star3, which aims to democratize data for all users by providing real-time user-facing analytics. So this will be a recorded session. So it won't be live presentations, but you can still put your questions in the Q&A sessions because after the presentations, Nia will be here and she can answer your questions. So now, please welcome on the stage Nia Pavar. The title of her presentation, User Facing Real-Time Analytics Using Apache Final. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. I am very excited to present to you the talk, User Facing Real-Time Analytics Using Apache Pino. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Neha Pawar. I am an engineer at Startree, which aims to democratize data for all users by providing user-facing real-time analytics. I'm also a committer and PMC on the Apache Pino project. All right, so let's get started. Now, the first question on everyone's mind must be, what is user-facing real-time analytics? I like to call user-facing real-time analytics as analytics of the now and analytics for the all. There's two aspects to this, one being user-facing and the other being real-time. To understand what's real-time analytics and why it's needed, let's start by looking at this graph, which shows the relationship between time and the value of data. Yesterday might be a long time ago for some businesses and they cannot afford to wait for ETLs and batch jobs to make data available for analytical insights. Insights are the most valuable to them if they are delivered instantly or as close to instant as they can possibly be. The other aspect is user-facing analytics. And to understand this better, let's take a look at the evolution of real-time analytics in companies. Typically, it starts here with internal analytics. This is usually to monitor some business metrics and is done by a handful of operators by monitoring some dashboards on a day-to-day -day basis. The queries per seconds tends to be low in such cases and the latency expectation is usually sub-seconds. As the business grows, you bring in data scientists and analysts who start running more complex queries on the data to derive analytical insights for the business. These queries are of a more complex nature, but they're still ad hoc and low in terms of the queries per second. And the latency SLAs are more relaxed. Now, if you take this one step further by exposing these real-time analytics directly to your customers and end users, you get user-facing real-time analytics. Gone are the days when analytics was only something available to operator dashboards or execs and analysts in boardrooms. In a user-facing analytics application, think of the user base as all the end users of an app. Now this app could be anything, a social networking app, a food delivery app, a payments app, it's not just a few analysts doing offline analysis or a handful of data scientists in a company that are running a few queries for their models. This is all users receiving personalized analytics on their personal devices. And these queries are triggered by apps and not written by people. And so the scale will be as much as the active users on that app. And since this is for end users interacting directly with your app, the query latency SLAs needs to be in milliseconds. This is one of the key differences between internal analytics and user-facing analytics. User-facing analytics needs ultra-low latency at extremely high throughput. Let's see some examples of companies who have introduced such external-facing analytics and how it's been really transformative for their business. One of the best examples of a user-facing real-time analytics application is LinkedIn's iconic Who Viewed My Profile application. This application uses real-time event data to show you your profile views as fresh as a few seconds ago, sliced and diced by dimensions such as job title, country. 
and as you can imagine to load something like this data needs to be captured every time a member views someone else's profile and then the queries need to be executed on that data each time a member visits the who viewed my profile section for a company of the scale of linkedin with over 700 million members this easily translates to several thousands of events per second and queries per second one of my favorite user facing real time applications from linkedin is the linkedin feed whenever you log into linkedin and look at your feed the feed model fires several queries at pino to decide what items to show you and in what order a technique called impression discounting is applied to make sure you see a relevant and fresh feed based on your interactions the query sent to pino looks pretty straightforward it's a bunch of filters with range clause in clause and a group by and some aggregations but the amazing part is that this happens at linkedin scale so that's hundreds of billions of records and tens of thousands of qps with query latency sla in milliseconds another great example is uber eats restaurant manager Uber created Uber Eats Restaurant Manager to provide restaurant owners instant insights about their orders data. On this dashboard, you can see sales metrics, missed orders, inaccurate orders, all in a very real-time fashion. Along with other things such as top selling items, menu item feedback and so on. Now, as you can imagine, to load this dashboard, we need to execute multiple complex analytical queries. all executing concurrently and then multiply this with all the restaurant owners across the globe and that leads to a lot of queries per second for the underlying database and in all three of these applications the data needs to be as fresh as possible and the queries must execute in the order of just milliseconds so that the users get a fresh and interactive experience so to summarize from the above user facing real time applications comes with a unique set of challenges such applications require the freshest possible data and so the system needs to be able to ingest data in real time from a pub sub system such as kafka kinesis or event hubs and then the system needs to be able to make it available for querying instantly in real time data for such apps tends to be event data for a wide range of actions and interactions coming from multiple sources and so the data comes in at a very high velocity and tends to be highly dimensional queries are coming from end users interacting with apps with queries per second in hundreds of thousands and having arbitrary query patterns and the latencies are expected to be in just milliseconds so that we can ensure a good user experience plus as a system you would want it to be highly available reliable scalable and also have a low cost to serve now lots of system options must be popping into your head you must be wondering hey uh, i could just do this with elastic search or another such search based systems or can't i just use presto or maybe i already have a key value store will that be enough or what about uh, just using a data warehouse so let's uh, look at all these options available to us in the analytics landscape and see if we can use any of those for our user facing real time analytics application so firstly you cannot use a data warehouse because we need a system that is highly optimized for ultra low latency and high throughput analytics involving heavy arbitrary slicing and dicing and data warehouses are not designed for such kinds of ingestion capabilities query loads or latency sls systems like presto or bigquery they offer tremendous flexibility and rich query sets but they can only promise latency sls of seconds and cannot be used for interactive user facing analytics Elastic search and similar search based systems are typically optimized for free text search. They rely heavily on inverted indexes and have rigid query plans, 
because they need to simply get matching documents and are not optimized to scan all, aggregate or group by on the documents. To achieve arbitrary slice and dice in key value stores like Kylin or Cassandra, you would have to pre-compute every possible combination and keep doing so every time you add a new dimension, resulting in loss of flexibility and explosive storage. So, how did LinkedIn, Uber, and many others build their user-facing real-time analytics applications such as the feed, Uber Eats restaurant manager, who viewed my profile, and so on? They used Apache Pino. Apache Pino is a distributed OLAP data store that can provide ultra-low latency even at extremely high throughput. It can ingest from batch data sources such as Hadoop, Azure, S3, and more importantly, it can ingest from streaming data sources such as Kafka, Kinesis, Pulsar, and make it available for querying instantly in real time. At the heart of the system is a columnar store along with a variety of smart indexing techniques and pre-aggregation techniques for low latency. These optimizations make Pino a great fit for user-facing real-time analytics and even for other applications like anomaly detection, dashboarding, and ad hoc data exploration. Apache Pino was originally developed by engineers at LinkedIn and Uber, and today is a very mature product used by lots of big data companies across the globe in production. The open source community has been growing very rapidly, and here's some numbers to help you get a sense of the scale of Pino. Some of the largest Pinot clusters have been known to ingest data at over a million events per second, while supporting hundreds of thousands of queries per second and maintaining stringent latency SLAs in the order of just milliseconds. So, how is Pinot working under the hood? To understand that, let's take a look at a high-level overview of Pinot's architecture. Let's say that we have a pub substream like Kafka from which we want to ingest our event data. The first component in the cluster is the Pino servers. These are directly consuming from the stream and indexing data as it is being consumed. Additionally, they also serve queries of the data that they have indexed. The next component is the Pino brokers which take in queries from clients, forward them to the servers, they will merge the results and then send them back to the clients. And finally, we have the controller, which manages all other components of the cluster with the help of Helix for cluster management and Zookeeper as a metadata store. Now let's drill down a little bit further into the exact mechanism that is used in Pino to ingest events from a real-time stream. Uh, let's assume that our Kafka topic has four partitions. Now, to get this data from this topic into Pino, we would create a Pino table. And when we do that, the controller creates a mapping from partition to server. So as you can see here, we have a mapping that maps the pink and the yellow partition to server one and the green partition to server two and the blue partition to server three. And then Helix notifies the servers to create consumers and start consuming from their assigned partition. So server one has started consuming from the pink and yellow partitions. Server two has started consuming from the green partition and server three is consuming from the blue partition. The data is indexed by the servers as it is consumed and kept in memory. Uh, and this is what ensures that Pino is able to serve the data instantly as it is ingested. Periodically, this in-memory data is converted to a Pino segment and flushed to the deep store. The consumption then resumes where it was left off. The controller is the single coordinator for all the integrations and we are automatically able to handle things like increase or decrease in the number of servers, increase in the Kafka partitions, changes in replication and so on. 
Now it's time for a demo where we are going to see just how easy it is to ingest events from a stream into Pino and begin querying. For the demo, I have chosen Kafka as the real-time stream and I have already downloaded the latest release of Kafka and started a Kafka cluster. And similarly, I have already downloaded the latest Pino release. And now I'm going to start a Pino cluster using a quick start command available in the Pino tools. While the Pino cluster is starting up, let's take a look at the data that we are going to push into Kafka and have Pino ingest those events. So here I have some data for add clicks. So this data has uh, columns such as country and browser device and then the metric clicks and then also a timestamp column. Uh, so in the real production application uh, setup, you would directly publish these events from your application using a Kafka producer. But for the purpose of our demo, we are going to uh, upload or rather push the events from this file using an uh, ad hoc one-time data push command. So I'm going to use the Kafka console producer command, which is available in the Kafka tools. And we will provide it the Kafka broker address and then also say that we want to create a topic called click events in which these events should get published. And with that, our events have been pushed to Kafka. And our Pinot cluster is also up and running. So let's go and create a Pinot table to start ingesting these events. So I'm going to open up localhost 9000. This is where the Pinot controller is running. And this pulls up the Pinot UI where you can see all the components of your cluster at a glance and also perform operations like creating tables and managing your tables. So I'm going to first create a real time table to ingest from our click event stream. But before we can do that, we have to add a schema. So schema is the place that lets you define how the columns of your table are going to look like. So let's create a schema called click events. And let's add the column country as a dimension. So in Pino, in the schema, you get to categorize your columns as dimensions or metrics or time columns. So dimensions are typically the attributes of your data. So these are the columns that you would use to filter or group by on. And then metrics are the numeric values that you are aggregating and monitoring. And then date time is for your time columns. Then let's add browser also as a dimension. And let's add clicks as a metric. And then let's add timestamp as our date time column and save the schema. And now that we have our schema, we can add our real time table called click events. Now this is the form where you will define all the config that you want your table in Pino to have. So as you can see, if you scroll below, we have indexing config, partitioning config and everything related to the table. So this form pretty much comes pre-populated with all the defaults. So all we need to provide is the topic name that we want to ingest from and the Kafka broker address. And when we save this, let's we can see that we have a table here called click events. And there is also a segment created for this table. And if you go to the query console and click on click events, you'll see we have all our data ready to be queried. Now you may be wondering that uh, you might not always have such a flat payload in your events. You might have something a little more complex. For example, 
uh, you could have something like this person data where each event is a person and each event is also a nested json so here you can see you have person and within that you have name and address and phone numbers array and then within address again you have street and line numbers even if you have unstructured and complex data like this you don't need to do any pre-processing or flattening on your own pino is able to handle all these things for you so let's see how we can do that let's begin by first pushing our events to another kafka topic called person complex and once our events are pushed in we can head over to pino to the cluster manager and create a new schema this time let's call it person complex and uh, let's add a column called person string so for this data set we are going to store the whole complex payload as one json string so let's add that as a dimension and then let's add timestamp as our date time column and now we can add the real time table called person complex and this time we are going to add transform functions on the column person string the function we will add is json format which is telling pino to take the person field and store it as a json string again we specify the kafka topic that we want this table to consume from and the broker address for kafka let's save this and now we can see our person complex table is created we have a segment here and now let's head over to query console and we can see our person complex table with all the records where each record is simply the whole json payload stored as a string now if you wanted to extract something very specific from this person string field you can use udfs during the query time so in particular this case we will use json extract scalar we will give it person string and then the json path let's say we wanted to query the name and with that we're able to extract exactly what we want from the complex json now you might be wondering that uh, you don't want to pay the overhead of running this udf with every query and you would rather maybe have that calculated upfront and have your queries run faster so you can do that as well without having to do any pre-processing on your own you don't need to flatten the data beforehand on your own to achieve this so let's see how we can do that let's go back to the cluster manager we will add a schema again this time let's call it person flat and let's list down all the columns that we want to extract from our complex person so let's say we want to extract name as a dimension and we want to extract address line one also as a dimension and also our timestamp column as a date time let's save that and add a real time table called person flat and this time we will add a transform function on name which will be called json path string and here we will say from person give me dollar dot name the json path and then we will add another one for address line one again json path string from person we want to extract dollar dot address dot street dot line one our kafka topic is the same as before person complex let's save this and let's go to our person flat table and let's check it out in the query console and here we have our nested json all flattened out for us using udfs along with the udfs that we saw in the demo pino has a rich set of udfs to be able to transform and extract fields from unstructured data 
we have date time conversion functions array functions math and string operations and you can also write groovy scripts into your udfs for the more custom and complex logic and this whole udfs architecture is designed in a pluggable way so you can very easily write your own udf and plug it into the pinot cluster all right so so far we saw how data is ingested into pinot from a real time stream and how we can query that data and how pinot makes it available instantly for querying now let's see how pinot handles the rest of the aspects in particular the optimizations and features that help with high throughput low latency earlier on i said that pinot has a variety of smart indexing techniques and pre aggregation techniques for high throughput low latency that make it a great fit for user facing analytics let's take a look at some of them pino offers a bunch of powerful indexes which are super useful when you're trying to bring your latencies down each of the indexes will help with speeding up certain types of use cases so for instance we have inverted index and sorted index which will help speed up queries with filter predicates here's a benchmark that was run for an aggregation query with a filter predicate as you can see the raw scan of the data took over 2 seconds whereas with inverted index and sorted index the query ran in just a few milliseconds then we have range indexes which will help with uh, range filter predicates such as queries which will have timestamp greater than x or say cost is less than or equal to y Now this is very useful for especially for use cases like anomaly detection which typically has time series data and require a lot of range queries. Here's a benchmark showing the speed up we can achieve by using a range index for queries that use range filter predicates. Next we have text index which enables complex use cases like free text search and log analytics. and then this benchmark shows how for performing a regex or text match on your data configuring a text index will be significantly faster than doing a raw scan and then we have some very special indexes like the geospatial index which will help you render complex geospatial visualizations and then we have the star tree index and json index so let's talk a little bit more about the star tree and json index Star tree index allows you to maintain pre-aggregated values for certain dimension combinations and you can choose exactly which dimensions you want to pre-aggregate and also how many values you want to pre-aggregate. For example, assume that our data has columns country, browser, device, OS and the metric clicks. And we want to create a star tree index on it. but we only want to say materialize country and browser so this is how our star tree index will look like with the country aggregations and then uh, the browser aggregations below each country now when we get a query like this with a filter on country and browser this is going to be super fast because it's just going to be a point lookup and we did not have to pre aggregate everything to achieve this nor did we have to do anything on the fly so effectively star tree index lets you choose your overhead and strike a balance between pre aggregating everything and doing everything on the fly this index is especially useful for point lookup queries and queries that involve a lot of arbitrary slice and dice on various columns So here's another benchmark that shows the star tree index in comparison to our inverted index. So star tree index helps us achieve even more speed up than an inverted index, making it one of the most powerful indexes in Pino. Another interesting and useful index is the JSON index. So often we see data coming in into our streams is unstructured and is in the form of complex and nested objects. for example this person's data that we also saw in our demo we saw that pino was able to ingest the unstructured data and store it as a json string 
and then we tried a bunch of things we used udfs to extract fields from the data during query time and then we also moved our udfs to the ingestion level because we wanted to make our query faster but then that moved the complexity of writing the udfs to the ingestion side and also made the ingestion slower so with json index we can simply keep the json blurb as a json string in pinot and json index will create an index for every field within the complex json so you can skip the query time udfs you can skip the ingestion time extractions and your queries will still be super fast to give you something to compare with uh, if you take a query like this where we want to fetch all records where the first address in the array of addresses uh, matches fun street so without json index this query took tens of seconds because it had to read each record then parse the json then extract the first element of the array and then do a match but with json index this took just a few milliseconds because it ended up being just a point lookup now all these indexing techniques really help Pinot reduce the number of records that need to be scanned within a Pinot segment. Now let's go one level up and talk about a technique that helps Pinot reduce the number of segments that are processed for a query. So this technique is called data partitioning. Data in Pinot is by default partitioned by time. And this works great for queries that have a temporal filter in which case only the subset of segments that fall in that time range are queried. But in many cases, uh, columns other than the time column are predominantly used in the filter predicate. For example, LinkedIn datasets are primarily queried with columns such as member ID or company ID. Uh, in such scenarios, the input data can be partitioned on such columns and Pinot in turn will generate partition aware segments during ingestion. So for instance, if you look at this example, we have uh, again our person's data, which has a field called member ID. And uh, we want our stream to be partitioned on this member ID. And once we do that, when Pino ingests from the stream, it is able to create Pino segments that are partition aware. So every segment will keep track of which partition it consumed from and hence what are the member IDs that it contains. And during the query time, the Pinot brokers will perform partition aware query routing. So a query with a filter predicate on member ID will only be routed to the segments which contain that particular member ID. Such partition based pruning minimizes the number of segments processed on each Pinot server, uh, which in turn reduces the work done by the CPU and lowers the per query latency and boosts the throughput. And that brings us to the end of this talk. Uh, some of the key takeaways that I'd li like to leave you with today are uh, user-facing real-time analytics is the new era of real-time analytics. And Apache Pino is at the forefront of this real-time analytics revolution, pushing the boundaries of what you can expect from real-time analytics and who you can provide it to. I'd also like to leave you with some resources if you are curious to learn more about Pino, here's the link to our documentation. If you would like to know more about Pino use cases from various companies, you can check out the blogs at this link on our Startree website or check out the talks that are available on the Pino YouTube channel. You can follow the Pino project on Twitter. We are at the rate Apache Pino. And we, of course, welcome you to join the Pino community Slack channel to discuss your user facing and real time analytics use cases. Thanks. Hi, Nia. Hey. And, uh, welcome, welcome back or welcome to the stage. So uh, as I said in the beginning that this was a recorded video, but uh, you will be here for the questions and there are questions actually what oh, uh, you can answer and we have about 10 minutes for them so if you still have questions from the audience then you can put it in the stage tab the, under the Q&A. So the first question 
Nea. Hi, can you talk more about the scaling possibility of the tool? How does it handle the scared workload? Does the nodes have some consensus? What was the latest data? Uh, could you repeat the last part? Does the node have some? It's a lot of questions in one, so <laughs> uh, only the last one. Does the nodes have some consensus? What was the latest data? Right. Uh, so for scaling, like the because we have like servers layer and brokers layer and then the controllers layer as explained in the architecture, you can pretty much scale any layer independent of the other. So you can scale the servers horizontally or vertically based on if you need uh, more power on the individual server, or if you feel that the brokers are being the bottleneck, you can scale them vertically or horizontally. And same with the controllers. So usually you would scale the controllers if you want it to, uh, to have kind of a replication between who is coordinating everything. Um, and it's... Uh, very easy to just keep adding nodes at any of these levels and concerns about the freshness of the data was the last part right so for the real-time ingestion pretty much as soon as the event is available in the stream it is available in pino because like we saw that uh, the latest data is being ingested in real time and kept in memory and then periodically it is flushed so as soon as the pino server gets that event it's ready, it's indexed, and it's ready to be served. Thank you. So the next question, what are the use cases when it is not suggested to use? Uh, when it is not suggested, so uh, I would think you can pretty much use it anytime, but where it will really shine for you is when you want like the ultra low latency and high throughput. So think of when you need uh, like you need to build a UI on your big data that you've collected. So you, if you have it in some data warehouse or if you have it in like a Presto or a BigQuery kind of a system, you can very well run ad hoc queries or you can maybe build a dashboard that some of uh, your internal users are going to use. But the minute you want to build something that's going to scale to uh, millions of users and tens of thousands of queries per second, that's when it would be uh, where it's really gonna shine. So I wouldn't say there is a case where you wouldn't use it. Uh, maybe one, one thing I would like to call out is since we value uh, low latency so much, there are some features that we don't support. For example, we don't have support for joins, but even in that case, there is, uh, we have the synergy that we've built with Presto so we have Presto Pino connector. So anything that Pino cannot support in terms of uh, full SQL support like joins, uh, we can pretty much add Presto to the ecosystem and then Presto will push down anything that it can to Pino and then you get the best of both worlds. So then the possibilities just become endless. Thank you. The next question, what are the limitations of SQL comparing to the standard one? Right, so just like I mentioned in the previous answer, uh, it is not full SQL, it is a subset of SQL. Uh, for example, joins are not supported, that's one of the biggest ones. But uh, two points to mention here, one is the Presto Pino connector. So we have uh, companies like Uber and uh, Cloud, uh, city storage systems that I showed in the uh, Powered by Pino slide. So. Both of these are like really using the Presto Pino connector really well. And uh, that kind of eliminates all these limitations added by the limited SQL support. And uh, we are also continuously uh, bringing in whatever are these missing SQL uh, features into Pino. So there's already lookup join that is being supported and there's already talks in the community for supporting the full joins as well. Okay. Thanks. So we still have a few questions. Can it handle joins or where time ranges? Uh, so joins we already addressed. Where time ranges, yes, it will handle that. And it handles that really well because uh, one of the indexes that we talked about was the range index, which is built exactly for these kind of use cases. So with range index, 
even if you put uh, clauses like where timestamp is greater than this and timestamp is less than this or anything, even those kind of queries are just an index lookup. So definitely handles range queries extremely well. Okay, great. We still have three questions. Does PINO calculate pre-aggregates too, or is it mostly about indexing and partitioning? Right, so that's a good question. Uh, it has everything. So indexing, so definitely when you get started, you start with no indexing and then you just see how it's going for you. And then we typically recommend, hey, why don't you try inverted indexes? And then to make it even faster, we go to the start re-index which uh, like mentioned in the start tree index slide, it doesn't pre-compute everything, but it doesn't leave everything on the fly as well. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds because obviously if you pre-compute everything, then uh, that also is going to slow down your ingestion and make it inflexible. So it's a combination of everything. The beauty is that you have knobs and options for all of these things. So based on what you need, you can either be completely on indexing, do everything on the fly, or go to start re-index and have some pre-computations there and so on. Thank you. Still two questions. I'm not sure if they are repeated, but what about transactions? Are they supported by Pino? So typically the data in Pino is supposed to be mutable data. Oh, sorry, immutable data. So it's usually used for just like analytical style queries. So for uh, typically we wouldn't recommend that you try to do an OLTP style workload because the expectation is that you're just doing uh, analytical kind of OLAP style workloads. But having said that, I would like to call out one feature that I did not mention in the talk and it is called upserts. So this was a new feature contributed very recently by some of the engineers uh, in Uber and LinkedIn. And what that does is basically update if it's already there or insert if it's not there. And this kind of, uh, so think of a use case like you took a ride using an Uber and that event went into your uh, system that this person took this ride at this time and this was the fare. And then later on, somebody added a tip to that ride. So now we need to kind of update the total amount of that ride. So typically then if you just insert or emit another event, you're gonna end up with a duplicate record. But now that Pino handles upserts, we are able to kind of unlock all these kind of use cases where the event is kind of being mutated. So this is one example. And another example is where, uh, let's say typically you have orders data and then the status of that order keeps changing. So it's like uh, order placed and then shipped and delivered or returned. So again, it opens use cases like these where there's some nature of mutability in the data. Thank you. The last question, are there any reasonable limitations for string to be effectively processed? Uh, not that I know of, because we pretty much can do every, uh, every level of uh, optimization or optimizations on every level of the stack in Pino to strings also. You have uh, dictionaries for strings, indexes for strings and transformations. And so pretty much uh, no limitations. If your strings are very long, we also have JSON indexes, text indexes and so on. Thank you very much. That these are all of the questions.